Fetal alcohol syndrome is among the most common known causes of mental retardation and as such, it is a major public health problem. The purpose of this lecture is to provide a basic overview of what we know about the effects of prenatal alcohol exposure. It is certainly not meant to be comprehensive. For a more detailed overview, the references at the end of the presentation might be helpful. It is important to remember that as the mother consumes alcohol and her blood alcohol level rises, that alcohol is freely crossing the placenta and the embryo or fetus is being exposed to the same blood alcohol levels. The possible detrimental effects of prenatal alcohol exposure have been known for some time. On the left side of the slide are quotes to get people thinking about this. One from Aristotle and the other from the Bible. The lithograph is entitled Gin Lane and was done by William Hogarth. It depicts a condition that occurred in England during the first part of the 1700s. Gin was available cheaply due to a lifting of the tax. During this period, the birth rate declined, infant mortality increased and the incidence of epilepsy increased. These were all reversed when the British College of Physicians urged the Parliament to reimpose the taxation. There were also numerous studies conducted both in animals and in humans at the end of the 19th and at the beginning of the 20th centuries. All of these showed the detrimental effects of prenatal alcohol. However, for a variety of reasons, including prohibition, the effects of prenatal alcohol exposure did not attract much attention. While people recognized that the offspring of alcoholics had problems they felt that these were the result of poor genetic stock rather than to any direct effects of the alcohol. For example the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1946 stated the offspring of alcoholics have been found defective not because of alcoholism of the parents but because the parents themselves came from a defective stock. The modern era of the recognition of the detrimental effects of prenatal alcohol exposure began when Ken Jones, David Smith and Associates published two papers in 1973, describing a common set of features in 11 children whose mothers were known to be alcoholics or heavy drinkers during their pregnancies. Subsequently, it was discovered that a common pattern of anomalies had been described previously in the French medical literature in 1967 by a French physician. Philip Lemoyne. What each of these papers described was a common set of features that could occur in the offspring of mothers who drank heavily during their pregnancies. This constellation of features was named the fetal alcohol syndrome in 1973 by Jones and colleagues. In order to be diagnosed as having FAS, the individual must meet all three criteria. There is a specific pattern of facial anomalies, which will be shown shortly. There is pre- and or postnatal growth deficiency. Usually the children are born small, that is, less than the 25th percentile, and remain small, at least until puberty. Finally, there must be evidence of central nervous system dysfunction. This CNS dysfunction might be physical, for example, microcephaly. Or behavioral, for example, hyperactivity and mental retardation. There are pitfalls in the diagnosis of FAS. Sometimes the complete pattern of anomalies is not present. Various terms have been proposed for these cases, for example, FAE, which is fetal alcohol effects. ARBD, which is, alcohol-related birth defects. And ARND, which is alcohol-related neurobehavioral disorder, but each has its limitations and no fixed terminology has been accepted. Another problem relates to the age at which the diagnosis is conducted. It appears to be easier to diagnose this condition in young children, while the diagnosis in the neonatal period may be more difficult. Furthermore, changes in the face may occur as the individual grows into adulthood and obscure the typical facial appearance of FAS. For a more thorough discussion of the diagnosis of FAS and various related conditions, the reader is referred to the IOM report by Stratton and others in 1996. Of concern is the necessity of documenting the exposure history of the mother. The reluctance of physicians to inquire about the drinking histories of pregnant women, or women contemplating pregnancies. And the fact that many physicians are not well trained or not confident in their ability to recognize these effects.
This slide illustrates an extremely important point. Fetal alcohol syndrome only represents one point on what appears to be a continuum of effects from prenatal alcohol exposure. TARDS 1N may be fetal death and FAS. As one moves to the other end of the continuum, one may find isolated effects resulting from prenatal alcohol, maybe only some of the facial characteristics or maybe only behavioral problems. The point is that FAS represents only a small sampling of the effects of prenatal alcohol. Many more children are included when we consider those with FAE who might or might not have obvious signs of alcohol exposure, and those that do not manifest any physical features of FAS, but have behavioral problems. FAS is only the tip of the iceberg. Interestingly only 10 to 40 percent of the children of chronic alcohol abusers can be diagnosed as having FAS. However, there is very good data suggesting that these non-FAS children are affected, most notably behavioral and cognitive deficits. Even in children with normal IQs who have been exposed to alcohol prenatally, there is evidence that they do not live up to their true potential. The epidemiology of FAS is quite variable. Here are the results of recent surveys on the incidence of FAS. The incidence of FAS is somewhere between 1 per thousand and 3 per thousand. These are not very precise estimates, but vary depending upon the methodologies used. Also, rates can be ethnically, culturally, and regionally dependent. The incidence of FAE is considerably higher but there are really no good estimates given the wide range of outcomes. Finally, about 12.5% of childbearing age women are at risk drinkers, that is, greater than 7 drinks per week and 5 or more drinks per occasion. The data on the left side of the slide come from Louise Floyd of the CDC. The first four studies were sponsored by the CDC and the other two estimates on the left side come from the IOM report from Stratton in 1996. AI-AN stands for American Indian slash Alaska Native. The numbers on the right side are from a recent study by Sampson and others in 1997. They demonstrated rates of FAS of at least 2.8 per 1,000 live births in Seattle, 4.6 per 1,000 in Cleveland and between 1.3 and 4.8 per thousand in Rubix, France. Interestingly, in this study they estimate the prevalence in Seattle for FAS and ARND at 9.1 per 1,000 births. This would mean that nearly one in every hundred children is affected by prenatal alcohol exposure. The last number from South Africa is from recent work done by Phil May and colleagues. It must be stressed that the facial characteristics basically define FAS. Without these facial features, one cannot be diagnosed with FAS. In particular, the discriminating features are short palpable fissures, that is, the length of the eye opening, a flat midface, an indistinct or flat philtrum, which is the ridge under the nose, and a thin upper vermilion, that is, lip. While each of these can occur in a variety of disorders, the combination of these features appears to be consistent with heavy prenatal alcohol exposure. Children with FAS can also have other facial features, such as epicanthal folds, that is, tiny folds of tissues along the eye opening, a low nasal bridge, an underdeveloped jaw and minor ear anomalies. These individuals can also have a variety of associated features. Heart defects skeletal anomalies, altered palmar creases, which are those creases on your hands, and your genital anomalies are among the anomalies found more frequently in FAS. Here are two other children with FAS at four different ages. The FAS features are apparent even as these children mature. The brain on the left was obtained from a five-day-old child with FAS while the brain on the right is a control. The effects are obvious. The brain on the left suffers from microencephaly, that is, small brain and migration anomalies. Neural and glia cells did not migrate to their proper location in the brain, but instead many of them simply migrated to the top of the cortex. Although it cannot be seen here, there is also a genesis of the corpus callosum and the ventricles are dilated. The corpus callosum is the major fiber tract connecting the two hemispheres of the brain.
which will be discussed later. Major findings of other autopsies of children with FAS have found microcephaly, hydrocephaly, cerebral dysgenesis, neuroglial heterotopias, corpus callosum anomalies, ventricle anomalies, and cerebellar anomalies. It must be pointed out, however, that these autopsies have typically been conducted only on the most severe cases, since these children often have enough problems that they do not survive. The interested reader on the pathological changes that occur in FAS is referred to the references at the end of the presentation. The image on the left is a normal midsagittal MRI scan of the human brain with the cerebrum and cerebellum pointed out. The data on the right show the reduction in size of the these two areas in children with FAS and PEA. The acronym PEA stands for Prenatal Exposure to Alcohol, and includes children with known histories of heavy prenatal alcohol exposure, but who lack the features necessary for a diagnosis of FAS. As can be seen, the extent of reduction in the volume of both the cerebrum and cerebellum is significant. While the PEA group shows a reduction in volume, with these sample sizes, this is not a significant difference. Other brain imaging studies indicate disproportionate size reductions in the basal ganglia, cerebellum, and corpus callosum. The data are presented as percent of normal matched controls. One anomaly that has been seen in FAS is agenesis of the corpus callosum. While not common, it occurs in FAS cases, about 6%, more frequently than in the general population, which is about 0.1%, or in the developmentally disabled population, which is about 2-3%. to In fact it has been suggested that FAS may be the most common cause of agenesis of the corpus callosum. In the top left picture, is a control brain. The other images are from children with FAS. In the top middle the corpus callosum is present, but it is very thin at the posterior section of the brain. In the upper right the corpus callosum is essentially missing. The bottom two pictures are from a 9-year-old girl with FAS. She has a genesis of the corpus callosum and the large dark area in the back of her brain above the cerebellum is a condition known as coprocephaly. It is essentially empty space. Most children with FAS do have a corpus callosum, although it may be reduced in size. The reduction in size occurs primarily in the front and rear portions, that is, the genu and splenium. One interesting item is that this same pattern of reduction in the genu and splenium has been found in ADHD children. The behavioral problems seen in FAS frequently are similar to those seen in ADHD.